Sometimes, if we figured out that, you know, whoever your mate is is producing something that's not good, then we we wouldn't want to make sure that we don't we don't carry that trait on. <laughs> uh, you, you 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 know you're never going to get this to work with people, but <clears throat> but <laughs> and so I'm practicing Hitler's traits or you know his his uh, workings on on animals only. I don't know what Hitler was doing, to be honest with you, but what I'm saying is is I'm breeding away from undesirable traits and breeding just good traits in. And let me, while we're talking about that, let me just give you a, a little quick scenario. Y'all may not know this. Some of you may not know it. That even in people, that when you have a mating between a male and a female, dogs or people, doesn't matter, Almost never, ever do you produce directly from that male or that female in the offspring. You're, you are tapping into a genetic pool. And in that genetic pool is the genetics of the ancestry. And every mating normally would be a different matchup. For example, hypothetically, I use this with people explaining it to them from time to time. Hypothetically, <clears throat> let's just say that the male on the male side in this particular mating, um, on the male side, let's just say the matchup was a great great grandmother. That's what matched up in that mating in the genetic pool. And then on the mother's side, let's just say the matchup was the grandfather. Okay, then those offspring would have the genetic traits of the great-great-grandmother of the father and the grandmother of the mother. Then <clears throat> Hannah's looking this up to see if I'm telling that right. You're not. <laughs> then are you... Are you <laughs> it don't matter. Anyway, so... Um, that, but the next mating may be a totally different matchup. Now that's why, that's why in children, um, your your first child may be a tall, lanky, freckle-faced, red-headed boy. Your next child may be a stocky, built, olive-complected girl. That's why they don't look alike, but they, but they come from the same mother and father. They're just different, different genetic matchup in, in the in the mating, and that's the way that works. And so, if you don't know the genetics of the traits of, like that great great grandfather and that grandmother that matched up, then you don't have a clue what you're going to produce. But if you know all of those traits back for several generations, you have a pretty good predictability of what's going to be matched up. You know, if you've done it, you know, more than once, then after a while you can say, you know, like me, this dog and this dog in their mating, even though they match up differently, maybe each mating, they have good offspring production. They produce good traits, good desirable traits in their offspring. But when you just take, you know, you take two dogs and you just breed a dog to a dog and you don't know nothing about their ancestry or the genetic matchups, you don't have a clue. You're just shooting in the dark. You don't have a clue what you're going to produce. And therefore, people who are just call themselves breeders and just breed a dog to a dog and they don't research the genetics of the, in the history of those dogs, <clears throat> then they're just, you know, I just say they're hobby breeders or, you know, backyard breeders. They're just, they're just breeding dogs to dogs and they don't know what they're going to produce. And so you could very easily have 
some very undesirable traits and some undesirable health issues with those dogs. And the health issue is the main thing. You know, I tell everybody I breed number one for health issues. I, I try to breed away from bad health issues in a dog. Then I try to, you know, breed good temperament traits, number two. I want dogs to be calm, easygoing, you know, and then, of course, high intelligence, so they're easy to train. And so there's, there's a lot to be said for genetics. I mean, you know, there is some Bible for it, uh, you know. Jacob did produce those spotted ring straight uh, cattle or goats and sheep out of Laban's uh, flocks. And, uh, I mean, you could talk about it, but anyway, <clears throat> I can promise you it wasn't because they were just looking at them stakes in front of the troughs that caused them to come out the way they were without God's help. That, didn't, that don't work naturally that way. <laughs> anyway, I was talking this week. I don't know how I got on that. I, some way I got off on that. Anyway, that's just, you know, you can just do what you want to with that information. It's just, you know, I'm not even going to charge you for it. Anyway, so <clears throat> yeah, yeah, the, that's how I got on it because I was talking to her this week about you know I was, was talking to her about the Lord and uh, I was telling her uh, talking to her some about the things that's going to happen in that's got to happen before the Lord comes. And she said, I ain't never heard this before. Well, I knew she had never heard it before. I, you know, I just kind of dropped in a little corn to see if she'd eat it. And she said, I, I really like, I like hearing about this. I said, well, move to Arkansas. <laughs> anyway, uh, this pastor that I was talking to that was writing me, he wanted to know if... Uh, um, he was asking me questions about the beast. Um, he was asking questions about um, uh, who, you know, what, uh, the difference in the beast and Babylon. And I, it got me to thinking. And he was asking me questions about the the ten horns, the ten crowns. What does all this represent? And I thought, how long have you been in this? I mean, you've been pastoring in here for 25 years, and you don't know this? And so I got to thinking about it, and I thought, there's probably a lot of people that really might not be able to identify. Um, and you, you hear about it. You hear people say things about it. But rather not people really understand it, so let's... Uh, let's first go to the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation. Let's just talk about these individual uh, items. Of course, some of the questions he was asking me, the same chapter tells you who they are. In fact, let's start in the 17th, I mean in the 13th chapter. Let's start in the, tw in the 12th chapter. Okay, um, because, um, let me see if I can find, um, Okay, in the third verse, Revelation 12. It said, There appeared, in another, uh, there appeared another wonder in heaven. A, behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars from heaven, and he did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God in his throne. Okay, so in the third verse, 
Um, who is the red, this great red dragon? And what are the seven heads and the ten horns and seven crowns upon his head? So could somebody, is, is someone, would someone like to want to say, here's what the red dragon was? You want me to say, huh? Okay. <clears throat> um, somebody find me the scripture in uh, where Pharaoh was called a dragon. Pharaoh and dragon. That'll be a. Um, <clears throat> of course, let me. While they're looking that up, let me say this. Oh. Uh, right here in this chapter where it says that um, that old okay hold on to that there just for a second right here where does it say where does it call him a okay in verse 9 it says and that and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, so he, here in this verse, in this chapter, and also in the 20th chapter, there's only two places in the Bible, that the dragon is called that old serpent, the devil, Satan and the dragon. It gives you all four titles given to uh, evil or the evil one, the adversary. Uh, so um, that and so that kind of gives an, an idea. Now Ezekiel, Brother Durham is saying, Ezekiel what, Brother Durham? Verse 29, verse 3. Uh, let's let's start in the second verse where it says, "Everybody got it." Ezekiel twenty nine verse three: "Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him, and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God: Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the rivers." which has said, My river is my own, and I have made it for myself. So here, Pharaoh is called a, a dragon. He's the leader of a world uh, ruling nation. And of course, that's what these seven heads are. These are seven ruling nations. These are seven world powers is what they are. And I've told, you know, y'all have heard it over and over. Egypt is the first one. Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And, of course, we teach the U.S. is the seventh head. So those are the seven heads. Okay, this dragon, here it's called a dragon in the 12th chapter. It, um, and I'm just using this scripture in Ezekiel to show that the dragon uh, that the you know Pharaoh the ruler of Egypt was called a dragon now also in um, Isaiah go to Isaiah 27 I believe it's in the 27th chapter <clears throat> It says, the very first verse, says, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong word, sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So Leviathan here is, he's, call, he's called a dragon. I mean, he calls him that in the, it's a sea, uh, if you look it up in uh, Strong's, it's called a sea monster or a dragon. Um, but here he says, he'll punish Leviathan, that piercing serpent, 
even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he'll slay the dragon. He just keeps referring to him as a serpent uh, and as a... Uh, a, uh, as the dragon, a crooked serpent, and he refers to him as Leviathan. And Leviathan, uh, if you look it up in the Strong's, in the Hebrew dictionary, it says, some other large sea monster. The constellation of the dragon also is a symbol of uh, Leviathan. It's, it's translated Leviathan all six times. It's it's called a sea monster, a dragon, a large aqua, aqua, aquatic animal. So uh, anyway, I'm just I'm just showing you now. In that day, what day are we talking about? Let's back up to yes, brother Mark. He hath made me an empty vessel. He hath swallowed me up like a dragon. Mm -hmm. He hath filled his belly with delicates and cast me out. Good. So, <clears throat> so this dragon is this the dragon here in the twelfth chapter. We can go back. Well, I was going to go uh, just to show what day in that day uh, he's going to uh, bruise this dragon. Um, if you back up to the 26th chapter, um, it, let's get, look at the 19th verse. It says, Thy dead men shall live, this is talking about a resurrection, together with my dead body shall they arise, awake and sing, you that dwell in the dust, for the dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. This is talking about when Jesus was crucified, hung on the cross, and after his resurrection, Matthew 27, 52, many saints which slept were arose and went into the city and were seen of many. Here's a prophecy in Isaiah saying, Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. Jesus' body was dead. Together with my dead body shall they arise Awake and sing, you that dwell in the dust. They went back to dust. For the dew is as the dew of herbs in the earth will cast out the dead. Then he says in verse 20, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy door about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, the earth shall also disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So, <clears throat> in other words, the earth is going to give the righteous forth in a resurrection and the earth will no more keep them under, under in the grave, under the ground. They won't, won't cover their slain anymore. In that day, the Lord will... Uh, he, uh, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan. This is talking about Rome. It was a world power at the time that Jesus was in. And God brought judgment on that Roman world because... Uh, and, and that was the dragon that was in the sea, the sea of humanity. The sea is basically the ungodly world. And so, <clears throat> now let's go back to Revelations. So this, this um, the third verse, the, oh, okay. So there appeared a wonder in heaven, another wonder, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns upon his heads and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Now, there appeared a, uh, this great red dragon having seven heads, and I told you that was Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, and the United States. Now, most of the brethren in the body teach it this way, that it's Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, 
pagan Rome and papal Rome. They divide the two in Rome. Uh, Brother Linegar was the one that, that came up with the uh, realization that it's, it's the same Rome. It just, it changed. It, the leader changed from one of the Caesars to, to the papacy. But it's still, it's still Rome. It's still the Roman government that was a world power. And he began to see that the United States was going to become a dragon power. So if you go to the 13th chapter, we'll just do that right quick. And the, the um, uh, let, let, excuse me just a minute. Let's go back to the 12th chapter and third verse again. Right? I want to cover something there. I hope that y'all, you know, will maybe try to get get this, you know, get you know, make yourself some notes and kind of get it in your understanding, so that because I would like, you know, like if you said if I said, you know, who is the dragon in the twelfth chapter? Who's the beast in the seventeenth chapter, thirteenth chapter? And you said, well, it's, here's what it is, and I I would like to be able to say why. How do you know that? You already have an answer. You ought to have an answer as to why. Why do you believe that? Uh, and that's why I'm giving you these scriptures, because it tells you the why. Okay, now, here's one of the things I want to bring out in the third, third verse there in the 12th chapter. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew a third part of the stars from heaven. Okay. Seven heads, we figured that out. Egypt, Syria, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, and the U.S. Seven crowns upon its heads. Now, this, this, the reason I want to bring this out is because when we get to the 13th chapter, there's ten crowns on the head. Here, there's only seven crowns on the head. Okay, these crowns are, they are, uh, they're rulers. They're, you know, when, you, uh, when a king's, the king, he's got a crown. Uh, Jesus is shown to have a crown, a golden crown, a crown of gold. His ministry in the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation has a has crowns of cr crowns of gold, and so these crowns are are depict rulership. But here in the twelfth chapter, there's there's um, seven crowns. There's ten horns, and and of course. You, you gotta, now you've got to come up with who these horns are. Um, the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation has ten horns. And so does the 17th chapter. But you can't make those ten horns in both those chapters the same ten horns. And I'll explain to you why here in a minute. Huh? Horns. Okay, so... Um, so here there's just seven horns. And I, I, no, there's seven horns, uh, seven crowns, I'm sorry. Here in the third, in the third chapter, third verse of the 12th chapter. There's seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. In the 13th chapter and the 17th chapter, we'll go to those men, there's ten, ten crowns. Isn't there? Am I right or wrong about that? Ten crowns, same thing in the 17th chapter. So, But there's only seven here. And some of you theologians, you know, you, you, you could help me look at that. I don't know how many people actually notice that. I've been in the body for over 40 years, and I ain't never heard nobody talk on that. But my explanation of it is this. When this took place in the early church, they were in the sixth horn, Rome. And we've been in, we, it's been Rome ever since, but, but we haven't had a dragon power since, since Rome was depleted from being a world power. We ain't never had the seventh head rise up yet, or the eighth either one. We have had the ten horns rise up in the 13th chapter, but not in the 7th chapter. But here in the 12th chapter, 
In other words, it's telling something way in the future. The only explanation I can give you for the seven crowns, because there's ten horns mentioned here, which it's, it's foretelling of the ten provinces of Rome is what those ten horns are in the 13th uh, chapter. And um, that's what I would say it is right here in the 12th, 12th that it's those ten horns. He's giving... You know the whole picture of the of the dragon with having uh, seven heads and ten horns, but here seven crowns, and I'll just say that there is there there was no there wasn't even existence of the ten crowns, there was no rulership of them, and therefore those seven heads, uh, and, unless we could go back somewhere in history and find that at the time it was told that Rome, and this is possible, I, that's why I said if you, some of you theologians help me find it, because I've never used this myself, and I've never had anybody else use it, but there's a possibility that there were seven divisions in Rome at the time that that was written. Like the, just like when there was ten horns, there were ten provinces of Rome. There may have been seven, and that's what I'd like to know. I haven't researched that. So some of y'all may want to research that with me. Otherwise, I'd just say those seven horns are the seven uh, heads of the beast. Was was the, there wasn't anything ruling outside? You know, like provinces or divisions of one of those countries. Just that dragon power himself was the only crown there was, but. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm thinking probably there was seven divisions in Rome that ruled under uh, under Caesar. If you remember, there was, like for an example, Herods. There was Pilate. There were there were different divisions under the authority of Caesar. So I I would like to get that research because that's something I've never really delved into. I've thought about it, but I've just you know I've went on and just not took the time to search it out. Anyway, I think that would be interesting. Uh, the more I've worked in this book, you know, just the more I pick up, and, and I love being able to, to, to be able to explain uh, because I really believe that this book, God's going to really open it up to a full understanding before we have a, by the time we have a restored church. Okay, so go to the 13th chapter. I hope I'm not, you know, sometimes I feel like I deal with the book of Revelation so much that I almost bore people with it. And I, I really don't want to do that in one way. In the other way, i just like to tell you to get over it. It's what God's called me to do. There is no question in my mind about that. And, and since, since I'm the pastor of this church, that's part of your duty is to hear what God's called me to do. Somebody in the body's got to get the message on it, and, and you people, in my opinion, are, are fortunate enough to hear more on it than a lot of people get to hear on it. So, you know, get it. You know, I used to... Uh, <laughs> Brother Brett used to ask me, why do I need to know anything about that book of Revelation? He, he, he didn't like me talking on it. I said, well, it's in the Bible. And the Bible said, blessed is he that hears the words of this prophecy. <laughs> you know, so I think we, if we want to be blessed, this, this book's wrote for us. We need to get it too. Anyway, he said, okay, I'm going to try to get it. Um, okay, the 13th chapter. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. There it is. And upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion, the dragon gave him his power and his great seat and, uh, uh, and the great authority. Um, Y'all... Let's just go back in our memory and remember that 
the dragon had uh, his tail drew a third part of the stars out of heaven. Y'all, y'all know about that. The tail. Remember, Isaiah said the tail is the uh, teacher teaches lies, but the head is the ancient and honorable. The tail of the dragon <clears throat> withdrew a third part of the stars. It's the exact same thing I've been telling you about. You know, a third part of the those that were in the sea died in the in the. Uh, third trumpet, the the fountains of waters and the rivers. That, In other words, a third part, the judgment, I've told you all, there's, there's an eternal judgment in the early church. There's eternal judgment in the restored church in the end of the Gentile world. Then there's eternal judgment down through the thousand years. And the great white throne after the thousand years continues the eternal judgment. Well, the, these the stars fell out of heaven so the tail withdrew a third uh, part of the stars and and from heaven though that was a that was when the church fell away false teaching entered in and the whole thing fell away that's why they fell out that's why it drew them them stars out of heaven so <clears throat> I just thought I'd mention that since we were there okay go to now we're in the 13th uh, chapter and I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns now here it's a beast instead of the dragon but we've covered the fact that Leviathan you know was come out of the sea was being punished out of the sea it's just different language uh, It just shows it's a venomous beast. If you go to the the, uh, the uh, Greek dictionary, so we're still dealing with you know a, a dragon or a serpent. So we're still dealing with these seven heads: Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. So the beast is world powers. Just get that in your head. The dragon's world powers, the beast's world powers, it's the same thing. It's talking about the same thing. Okay, and then here, there's ten horns, and on the horns, ten crowns. Well, at this time, Rome had ten provinces. I've gave you all those provinces before. I don't know if you, do you all want me to take just a minute and give them to you so you can write them down? You could write them in the back of your Bible. Um, that's where I have them. <laughs> you know, you can't remember everything. But I'll give them to you right quick. I've gave it to you before, but the the ten provinces of Rome was the Anglos, Anglo-Saxons. And if you would write a dash out beside that, today that is England. So it'll help you know. The Anglo-Saxons was the one of the provinces of Rome at the time that this was written, or, or at the time that Rome was in power. There were ten provinces. Anglo-Saxons, but today it's England. Okay, then the other one, another one was the Franks. And today that's France. Okay. <clears throat> the next is Suevi, S U E. V-I. Today that is Portugal. Okay, the next is the Visigoth. Visigoth. V-I-S-I-G-O-T-H. Yes. Today the Visigoth is Spain. Okay, then the Burgundians. B u r g a n d i a n s. Addie, are you getting this? She's writing it down. The Burgundians today is Switzerland. D 
in the Lombards, L-O-M-B-A-R-D-S. Today is Italy. And then the Huns, H-U-N-S. Today is Germany. Okay, now, the next one is the Vandals, V-A-N-D-A-L-S. You can put dash destroyed by Rome. It doesn't exist today. The next is the Hurulis, H-U-R-U-L-I. They were also destroyed by Rome. The Ostrogoths, O-S-T-R-O-G-O-T-H-S. That's the tenth, and it was also destroyed by Rome. Yes, Brother Boyd? Uh, they were destroyed between 325 and 538. They weren't destroyed at the same time. The Pope of Rome had to destroy them after the... What happened was, is the... Uh, at the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325, the Pope of Rome came up with the doctrine of the Trinity, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost was one God made up of three different persons, and they were all equal in authority. And those three province, provinces were... Arians, A-R-I-A-N-S. They were all three Arians that believed in two in the Godhead and they would not accept the Council of Nicaea's new doctrine the Pope came up with on the Trinity and they rejected it and they rejected the Pope as their leader. And that's why he destroyed them because I'll show you right here in the 13th chapter. Let's, let's look at that for just a moment. Okay, it says, I still on the sand, see a saw, beast, rob, having seven heads, ten horns, and his horns, ten crowns, and upon his head is the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet was likened to the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. How his head was wounded to death was when he came up with this doctrine of the Trinity, and those three provinces rejected him, he no longer had power over the whole world. Those three provinces pulled out from underneath him. And the way he got healed was he destroyed those three provinces, and it took him from A.D. 325 to 538 to get it destroyed. Yes. Brother Smith, um, now Martin Luther was in the early 500s. No, no. Martin Luther's in the 1500s. Oh. He wrote his theses on That's the, right. He wrote okay. his theses. I was just wondering 15, if he 17. had the doctrine of the Arians or what doctrine he care, held. No, as he held the Trinity. Did he? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now, turn with me to the seventh chapter of, of this Daniel. See, the reason this is important is because just because somebody tells you who they think, and, and by the way, if you read or hear, listen on the book of Revelations, out here in this world, it is the most conglomerated mess I have ever seen in my life. It makes no sense. And there's men in the body. There's men in the body that can't make a lick of sense out of it either. You know, so you... you I mean, that's why you got to have these scriptures to know what, what it's talking about. You know, I mean, I love the brethren in the body, but a lot of them are just teaching, you know, whatever they've heard. Okay, in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. <clears throat> okay, we're going to tie this together here. It says in the first year, the first verse, first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel, had a dream and visions 
of his head upon the, his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and his heart was given to it. A man's heart was given to it. That was Babylon. Okay, what, what, what Daniel's dreaming here, and, and if you read, <clears throat> look in the 17th verse right quick. Let's just get that right now. It says, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Okay, what Daniel got a picture of, of these kings and world powers, was Babylon was ruling at the time that he got this. He was in Babylon. Uh, he was, you know, Babylon was the world power at the time that he got this. And he got a revelation, a prophetical picture of the future of the world from his time. Okay, so Babylon was this lion. All right. Then verse 5 said, And another beast, a second likened to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Now, <clears throat> those three that... Those three ribs in his mouth was Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. Okay? This is Medo-Persia, by the way. The bear is Medo-Persia, which was the next world power after it overthrew Babylon. And you'd have to read some history, but here's the history. The way that Medo-Persia overthrew Babylon, Egypt and Lydia helped Babylon war against Medo-Persia, but they lost. And that bear, that bear plucked up the ribs and, and got those, those three powers. He over, they overthrew those three powers, and Medo-Persia became the world power at that time. Okay, verse 6 says, After this I beheld, and another likened to a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. This is Greece. Uh, Alexander the Great had four generals that that he ruled with, and and so this this leopard was when Greece overthrew Medo Persia and became a world power. All right. Then after this, in the night, visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Okay, this is Rome. He didn't even know what kind of beast to even liken it to. It was a powerful, dreadful beast that he didn't, he didn't know what to call it. He just called it a dreadful beast, and, uh, and it had ten horns. This is Rome with its ten provinces. See, later in the 17th verse, he declares these four beasts, these are ten, I mean, they are kings of the earth, or four kings. Okay, now verse 8 says, I considered the horns, and beheld there came up among them another little horn. This is the papacy. See, this, the, the dreadful beast was Rome, but now here comes a little horn. There already were ten horns, but here's another horn. There's ten provinces before whom there was three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. This is when the papacy destroyed those three provinces in Rome that I just gave you. Okay? And behold, in this, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, mouth speaking great things. And I beheld till 
the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued, for, came forth from before him. Thousands, thousand thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him and judgment was set. And the books were opened. So here, <clears throat> the, the Pope of Rome and the... Okay, but there's going to be a judgment that will take place by, the son of, by, by Christ. Now, Christ, you know, he came during the time of Rome. And his church, his qualifiers for the bride, they, they, uh, they stood with Christ in judgment. And, and I would say it would reach on down. If you go on down, I beheld there, be can't, verse 11, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. And uh, there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and tongues should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me, and I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me the, and made me know the interpretation of these things. Uh, th then he said, These great beasts, which are four, uh, are four kings, which shall rise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Then I, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, will, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue of his feet and the ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given unto the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. See, this goes all the way down to the restored church and it goes into the the millennium. It, in other words, it goes all the way down showing the the finish. It just doesn't give all the details it's given in the book of Revelation. But Daniel was given a great revelation of the future at the time he got it. So, uh, anyway, I won't go into any more because we're running out of time. So we, di we didn't get to the 17th chapter, but, but maybe we can cover it, you know, later. Uh, we got just a couple minutes. If you want to just turn real quick to the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, and I'll just say a couple things about it. Brother Smith. Uh-huh. Uh Daniel 7, did, did I understand you to say that it covers um, all the way through the end through the white throne judgment? Yes. Where? Okay. Yeah, in other words, he's just showing there that eventually the saints of God and the ancient of days overcome it all and they take charge of everything eventually. That, that winds up in the end. He just doesn't go into tremendous detail, but he basically, see, he covers down through the he covers down through time to Rome. Now he doesn't get into uh, he doesn't get into the two-horned beast, America. 
He doesn't get into it becoming a dragon, nor does he get into the fact that Rome becomes the eighth head again. See, America only, and, and, and it's clear in the 17th chapter that America is just going to rule for a short time as a dragon because it's going to make an image to the beast and put the beast back in power and the eighth head will be of the seven so Rome will come right back in. So, you know, he, he, doesn't get, he doesn't go into that because it winds up with Rome in the end anyway. So he, you know, he just shows that, you know, this great dreadful beast of Rome is what's finally going to dominate everything, but finally the saints of God in the Ancient of Days will rule rule the world okay let's take a break we'll have service upstairs in a little while uh, is it, before we leave is there any questions any more questions Adeline did you get all of it wrote down well you got what you could I'm sure all righty <laughs> she looked at me and then she looked at her mama like what how do I answer that All right. Brother Fisher's out of town today, by the way, in his family.